welcome everyone to the Notre Dame Newman Center and University Church for Lament, an evening of Irish myth, music, and fol folklore at Samhain. We're happy to present Rona Fogarty, our speaker, Mick O'Brien on the Illin Pipes, Mary MacDonald on harp, and voices from the Notre Dame Newman Vocari Ensemble. Rona, a holder of a higher degree in Irish folklore and an MPhil in early Irish, will lead us into a world of banshee cries and things that go bump in the night. She will help us to explore the Irish roots of this liminal season where the veil between this world and the next draws thin. She will, in this liminal space, draw ties across history and belief as we look at the folk ways and the faith ways of death, mourning, and new life. As we enter into this hour of myth and song, let us commit to a time together Please silence your phones and refrain from using them, if you can, during this presentation. Please just note our exits in case of emergency. But let's try to not break this moment and to stay in this space that we are creating. Please hold any applause or notes of appreciation until our hour is done. We hope you'll stay afterwards for some light refreshment and fellowship on this night where Christians celebrate the lives and witness of the saints who have gone before us, embracing them as rays of hope in a darkening world, seeing in them the foretaste of what is to come for all who journey in faith. And so let us pray. Good and gracious God, in this particular moment in which the earth transitions from summer to winter. In this season in which we acknowledge the dying of this world around us and celebrate the fullness of all that is to come. On this day when we call to mind the lives of our forebears in faith and celebrate their steadfastness and conviction, we ask your blessing upon us as we enter into this time of storytelling and explore our relationship with you and all you have created. Open our hearts to find your loving presence alive in every being. Guide us in ways of courage, kindness, and peace, bringing hope to the world in all that we say and do. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And friends, I'd like to introduce Rona Fogarty. Thank you. It is Samhain. Samhain is the old Irish word for the festival period at the end of October and start of November. It harkens back to ancient times in Ireland and across the Celtic world. It was understood by the etymologists of the early medieval period to mean summer's end, deriving the word Samhain from words in the old Irish language, saw, summer, and fwyn, setting, or sinking. So Samhain is literally the setting of summer. The early 9th century Fáilire Oingaso, a calendar or martyrology of the saints, defines Samhain, Edon, Samhain, Edon, Bos and Tavrid. Samhain, that is, Sao Fwyn, that is, the death of summer. In the myth tale, Tokvak Evra la Quingulan, the wooing of Emer by Cuchulan, it is described thus O Havin, Edon, Sawfwin, Edon, Antaradan, Fwin Antaradan. From Sawin, that is, Sawfwin, that is the setting of summer. And further explains Aris J. Rin Noviad Fursan Liadanand. Edon in Severed o Beltana Kasavan, Agus in Givrid o Havan Kabialtana. For it is from this division that used to be on the year 
That is, the summer from Bjaltsina, May Day, to Samhain, and winter from Samhain to Bjaltsina. This reflection of the natural cycle in the names of the seasonal festivals across the Celtic countries in Ireland, Iha Hauna Halloween presages the month of Samhain, beginning after sunset on the 31st of October, before the feast day of Samhain on the 1st of November, as is the custom of Celtic festivals to begin the night before the day. In Scotland, it is also known as Samhain, and in the Isle of Man as Iha Hauna, all pertaining to the meaning of summer's end. In Brythonic-speaking countries, the festival is named for the other side of the frontier, as the beginning of winter, Calan the first of winter in Wales, Calan in Cornwall, and similarly, Calan Gwanb in Brittany. This division of the year into summer and winter house is very old. The famous Kalini calendar, a bronze plaque found near Lyon in eastern France in 1897 and dated to about the second century AD, features ancient Gaulish month names inscribed in Latin letters and shows the, the division of the year into summer and winter seasons. Mis Saonios is the month of summer and Mis Giavonios the month of winter, each dividing the calendar into two six-month periods conveying the duality of the Celtic year. However, that presents us with a slight problem. The Gaulish calendar of the continental Celts is at least seven centuries older than the ninth century Irish Fáilra Oingasa. The former assigns the Gaulish month Mead Salvonius to summer, but we assign its equivalent Samhain to the beginning of winter. Further, in the Dictionary of the Irish Language, a dictionary of medieval Irish, mainly of, from Old Irish 7th to 9th century and Middle Irish 9th to 12th century periods, the word Cathabun is explained as Cathabun, Edon, Bialtna, Mayday, which leaves a question as to whether summertime might have been the original celebration of Samhain and its festival was commuted to the end of summer, start of winter, for other reasons. More on that later. Samhain, as we have it today, and since the medieval period from at least the 9th century, celebrates the turning of seasons at summer's end on the cusp of the winter half of the year, when the agricultural year pivots, seeding summer into a time of burgeoning darkness, when the earth rests after the labour of the harvest and the cold season of winter begins. In myth and early history, great feasts were held at the royal centres of power in Ireland during Samhain, such as the Fesh Sauna at Evanvaca, Nabhan Fort in Armagh, seat of the kingship of the Ullid, or Ulstermen, and the Fesh Tevro, the great feast of Tara, where high kingship was celebrated, Brehan laws were promulgated, competitive games were held, and poetic conventions of the orders of the Philid, the high-status seer poets, assembled. In Shahrum Caton's first Fassa er Erin, a 17th century compendium of knowledge of Ireland, the Fesh Tevro is described as a great assembly of the poets and nobles of Ireland, occurring every third year for a period of six days of feasting, law-making, forging peace pacts and alliances between territories, inauguration or confirmation of kingship in the presence of high-ranking society and the oistona, the people of the arts. I quote from the Irish Tech Society edition of Forest Fassa or Erin, translated by the Reverend Patrick Deneen. Fesh tavrach gach tras flina, the cobble rach the isrigla, the nihi on tan shin gachan, egriagav una or Erin, the fesh of Tara, each third year, for fulfilment of laws and rules, was convened at that time mightily by the noble kings of Ireland. Three law resavan the grace, three law in a year fall javes, don tlua rabadiever doig, eg shirol rish on shacht voil. Three days before Samhain, according to custom, three days thereafter, good the practice, 
did that high-spirited company pass in constant feasting a week. Samhain features heavily in myth tales as a time of important and portentous events. Kath Turib, the Battle of Moitura, <coughs> is an epic tale involving magical enchantments, legendary heroes, prophecy, and a huge battle between the forces of good and evil on the eve of Samhain. In it, the massed forces of the semi-divine or supernatural Tuatha Dé Danann, the people of the goddess Dana, and the dark underworld spirits, the Fóvora, meet at Samhain after seven years' preparation for battle. The Tuatha Dé Danann seek to throw off the unfair tax tribute and unjust rule imposed on them by the Fóvora, since their own king, Nuadu, was wounded and deposed in a previous battle of the same name. They seek to fight the Fovora for supremacy, to restore their kingship and rule of martial arts. They are led by Lu Lovada, the Savil Dodach, the many skilled master of all arts, who appears at Samhain to lend his help to the Tuatha de Danann. His appearance is described as yellow haired and shining radiant. In several myths, He's described as appearing like the setting sun, or as though the sun rose in the west, with a radiant face and brow so bright that people could not look easily upon him. According to the Harvard scholar, Dr. Elizabeth Gray, the opposition of forces of light represented by the Tuatha de Danann to the forces of darkness, the Fovora, the misshapen underworld lords of misrule, represent the overturning of the natural order of things into chaos and then back into order at Samhain. As the Tuatha de Danann win victory and their rule is restored, reaffirming a just and ordered society. To quote Dr. Gray, the tale is a myth of Samhain, the season which yearly presents the continuing relation between order and chaos. Each year, Order must be renewed each year the battle fought. In the Lever Gavola Aaron, the Book of the Takings of Ireland, or Book of Invasions, first compiled around the 11th century AD and found as various copies and recensions in many manuscripts, a note within on the disguising or concealing of individuals from the other world is referred to, albeit ineffectual, at Samhain. I quote a uh, section. Ringus, <coughs> Edon, on Machog, Agus Oid, Agus Kermuth, three Mech in Dagda, Mech Elahan in Shin. Angus, that is, the Machog, and Oid and Kermuth are the three sons of the Dagda, sons of Elaga. Is Eid in Fishorda, Huskelset, Tiacht, Ishid, Arhus, Edon, Fet Fierda, the Vertish Druid, Ivan Duiruf, can a Tucker Tiforo. Ach gach sauna nova, ar ni feda an dichet idcha sauna. These are the men that first explored to go inside a sheath, that is a fairy mound. That is, druids put the faith fieda, a magic mist, around their people, so there would not be an attack upon them, except every sauna, for concealment was not possible on the eve of sauna. Implicit in this, perhaps, is the notion of the disruption of the natural order and interaction with the other world and the threat of harm. The oppositional battle at Samhain also occurs in the famous Toin Bo Cúine, the cattle raid of Puli, as Queen Medev, or Queen Maeve, and the forces of Connacht set out to do battle with Cúchalin, the hero of the Ulster men, at Samhain. This is preceded by a meeting with Fidelm Bonfoth, uh, Banforth, a prophetess who predicts the forthcoming slaughter with the most chilling words in the Irish myth. Ad keel for Darug, ad keel ruid. I see it crimson on them, I see it red. In this, she is something approximate to a banshee character foretelling of impending death. Again, <clears throat> themes of fire, Chaos, death, and destruction of order at Samhain are represented in the myth Tugal Brithna the Yerga, the destruction of the Yerga's hostel, the Yerga meaning the Red God. In it, 
King Conor Amor, High King of Tara, inadvertently breaks the ritual geshe or taboos impo imposed upon him as part of the sovereignty pact between the king and the land and its otherworldly denizens, the Ois Shiva, the people of the hills. Nine taboos are placed upon him, including three which evoke fiery images or delineate sunset as a liminal time boundary for the prohibition of certain actions. These include not to go into a red house preceded by three red men, which he does by entering the Yerga's hostel after pursuing three red riders on red horses. That no lone woman or man should be admitted to the house after sunset, yet he is visited by a supernatural harbinger of death in the form of a long-haired, grey-cloaked female who arrives at sunset, stands at the threshold of the door, ominously demanding entry, and he permits her to enter the house. She has many names, one of which is Samhain, and she puts the evil eye on him and predicts his death. Another taboo is that no light should be seen emitting from the house after sunset, nor light be seen outside from inside. Yet Connor kindles great fires inside the house, visible to all without, every flame described as the size of a burning oratory. By breaking his geshe, his taboos, the pact of sovereignty is dissolved. War breaks out. Connor's reign falls. The hostel of the Red God is destroyed by fire on the eve of Samhain, and Connor loses his life. The myth tale tells us that a great bale fire was lit as a warning beacon to Conora, and from that occurrence, the practice of lighting bonfires as beacons at Samhain began. Another association of Samhain with feasting, fire, and the infiltration of supernatural beings into the mundane world is given in the late 12th century Agalovna Shanoruch, the Colloquy of the Elders, in which Kuyatja, a great warrior and Ushin, son of the famous Fionn Makul, both members of the Fianna war band, recount tales of the exploits of Fionn and the Fianna to St. Patrick. One tale of which tells of how Fionn defeated the supernatural being, Alain Machmidna, of the fairy man Chiv Finachid. Each year at Samhain, Alain would leave his Shiv or fairy fort and go to Tara, where the great feast Fesh Tevro was being held. He would play a spellbinding tune on his tempon, a stringed instrument like a harp or psaltery, and it would enchant all to sleep. He would then burn Tara to the ground by breathing fire upon it. This happened for 23 years until Fionn Makul took him on and prevented Alain's destructive deed by using the venom of a magic spear to keep himself awake long enough to thwart Alain and see him retreat to the fairy mound to be pursued and killed there by Fionn. Further connection of Samhain with death and harmful supernatural beings is also given in the tale Achtra Nere, The Adventures of Nere, featuring in medieval manuscripts such as the 12th century Book of Leinster, the 15th century Yellow Book of Lecan, and 16th century Egerton 1782 manuscript. Though it is deduced by linguistic scholars to be several, several centuries older, perhaps dating to between the 8th and 10th century AD. In the tale, it was related that, and here I cite the Irish text from Egerton manuscript, Bavor irav adarkadina hadkashin, agus agrondate, agus the adbitish devna in adkid shin the grace. Great then was the darkness of that night and its terrors and demons used always manifest on that night. Perhaps vestiges of the aforementioned mythic associations with death, with fire, with feasting, with prophecy, with a three-day period of celebration at the juncture of summer and winter, the interaction with the other world and the manifestation of preternatural beings into our world are reflected in extant Halloween customs we perpetuate today, such as dressing up in the guise of spirits to conceal oneself from them or play the part of those supernatural visitors to our realm. The door-to-door -door collection of food and sweets for a Halloween feast, 
the associations with death and the paranormal, chaos or events out of the natural order of things. In our more recent folklore, it was believed that the doors of the Shia, the fairy mounds, flew open at Samhain and the Slua Shi, or fairy host, would ride out, changing their summer residence for their winter one, reflecting the duality of the agricultural year. As a result, going out on the eve of Samhain, also called November night or Halloween, was to be undertaken with caution, lest one come across the fairy host and be swept or taken away by them to their realm. The fairy folk were placated by the leaving out of a portion of Cali or Colcannon for them on the eve of Samhain, and places associated with them, rafts, fairy mounds, crossroads, best avoided. Folklorically, Samhain is a boundary festival in the Celtic year, a juncture point in time, and as such, it is a liminal setting where magic gets in and a superstition holds sway. The seasonal shift from summer to winter, the tilt into darkness, the crossing of a threshold in time, allows the conjunction of the other world with this world, facilitating the transition of souls and ethereal beings across that boundary into our world, and conversely allows us to access otherworldly knowledge from theirs. People were, then as now, always concerned with their future in terms of romance or love or career or health and fortune and fearing the prospect of death. And so various means of divination were employed to try to foretell what lay ahead in the coming year and beyond, entertaining prognostications of what will happen in the future. And you might remember some of these. For prospective romance, apples peeled in one go and the skin tossed over one's left shoulder so that it might fall in the shape of the initial of one's future spouse. I haven't tried this. <laughs> or to eat salted food so that when one dreams, the person who gives you water will be the one you marry. Some are quite dark. Girls peering into mirrors at midnight to try to see the face of a future husband, but risk seeing the face of the devil instead. Or a candle lit for each person in a group, and the first candle to go out would be the first one to die in the future. Some of them were downright dangerous, and I quote here um, some folklore records from the National Folklore Commission. On November night, there are many games played in every house. One is snap apple. We put a string out of the boards of the roof and two sticks on the end of the string in the form of a cross, with an apple on one end and a lighted candle on the other. And you might enjoy this one. Another trick that is played is to go into the garden in the dark and pull a head of cabbage. If the one pulled was a good big one with much clay attached, it meant a good big husband with plenty of this world's goods. But if a thin scraggy one was found, the finder was bound to get a poor specimen of humanity as a husband. <laughs> Some, of the, some tell of prohibitions or cautions at Samhain. It was supposed fairies roamed about on this night and no person would be seen out of doors after 12 o'clock on this night. Neither would a person eat a blackberry after Halloween, as it is said the fairies spit on them. A wonderful record from Crowhill in Galway describes many beliefs and prognostications and I'll just give a, a, a couple of these Colcannon from the earliest times. It has been the custom in this district to make Colcannon for Halloween. The first plate of this is kept for the fairies, lest uh, they should need food while changing from their summer residence to their winter house. No salt should be put on their portion. On the moon. On this night, if there is a moon, people try to determine their time of marriage by leaving a vessel of water out in the open and by holding a mirror over it. The number of moons one then sees in the water is equal to the number of years until he is married. The saucer trick. This well-known trick is played all over the countryside on November night. Five saucers are play placed on a table. A bead is put into one, a ring into another. 
a drop of water into a third, a piece of clay into a fourth, and the fifth is left empty. Each person is then blindfolded in his turn and puts his hand into a saucer. Whoever puts his hand into the first saucer will be a nun or a priest. Whoever puts his hand into the second saucer will be the first to marry. Whoever puts his hand into the third saucer will cross water. Whoever puts his hand into the fourth will be the first of the company to die. And the person who touches the empty saucer will remain single. Many of our older customs have died away, but we still celebrate this time with costumed children going from door to door as last night, with parties and with special Halloween foods such as the boreen brack or barm brack filled with tokens such as a coin for riches, a ring for marriage, a rag to indicate poverty, a stick for hardship, etc. Likewise, the traditional dish of Colcannon, potatoes and kale, might contain a coin for good fortune for the finder or a wedding ring to foretell marriage. And what of the corresponding religious celebration of All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, All Souls' Day? We might trace the religious development of this period through the agency of various popes in the early medieval era. Pope Gregory I, or Gregory the Great, held papacy in the late 6th century. He was monastic in his practice, a great scholar and writer, and initiated the Gregorian mission for the conversion of British Anglo-Saxon pagans into Christians by St. Augustine, whom he sent to England to lead the mission. In his letter to Abbot Melitus, who was travelling to England to join Augustine in Canterbury, he advised Augustine on how to deal with the conversion of pagans to Christianity. And here I quote from the translation of his letter, Epistola 76, as found on the website of the Jesuit University of New York. Tell Augustine that he should by no means destroy the temples of the gods, but rather the idols within those temples. Let him, after he has purified them with holy water, place altars and relics of the saints in them, for if those temples are well built, they should be converted from the worship of demons to the service of the true God. Later, in 609 AD, Pope Boniface IV decreed the Pantheon, the former temple of the pagan gods in ancient Rome, to be converted to a Catholic church dedicated to St. Mary the Blessed Virgin and the Martyrs, with a feast day of the 13th of May, a summer celebration. Pope Gregory III in the 8th century then moved this date later in the year to November the 1st and dedicated a chapel to all saints in Rome. His successor, Pope Gregory IV, extended the celebration of All Saints Day to November the 1st across the whole church. And it is here we might find the solution to the conundrum of why the Festival of Samhain sits at the threshold of winter but may originally have been related to summer. Our earliest sources in Ireland are from the Christian period, and the concordance of the celebration of Samhain with religious celebrations may have occurred to bring the festival into harmony with the Church, when veneration of All Saints' Day moved from May the 13th, a summer festival, to a winter one on the 1st of November. In both Christian practice and Samhain custom, we observe rites and beliefs centred on death and transition to another realm and mark the turning of the seasons in the year. In church, we pray for the souls of those who have departed this life. We compile November lists for the dead. We commemorate and celebrate their lives, reflect on their passing and hope in their soul's journey onwards from the end of this life into the afterlife of salvation. We pray for the saints and martyrs of the Church on All Saints' Day, this day, Samhain. We could say that both traditional Samhain custom and religious celebration unite in their shared connectedness with death, with transition, and interface with the spiritual realm at the juncture of light and dark halves of the year. Summer's set, winter's beginning. As we reflect on the setting of summer 
and the beginning of the winter half of the year. The ninth century poem attributed to the mythical hero Fionn Macul beautifully describes the onset of winter and the changes in the natural landscape when summer has gone. It is a remarkable feat of poetic composition to achieve such rich description and allusion in such short pithy lines. The poem is found copied into two 12th century manuscripts, Leverin of Hithra, the Book of the Duncow, and Rawlinson B502. I will read the normalised Old Irish version from Professor Gerard Murphy's Early Irish Lyrics so that you can hear the sound of the old language as it preserves the rhyme, and Father Gary will read my English translation. Scale them do if dav, snigid gav, rofoith sav. I have a tale for you. The stag bellows, winter pours down, summer has gone. Gwith ord ur, ishel green, gar arith, rothek rien. High cold wind, low the sun, short its course. The swift sea runs. Ro ruid rath, ro cleth cruth, ro gav gnoth, yogringoth. Deep red bracken, its form has been veiled. The cry of the wild barnacle goose has become common. Rogav ucht etje ein agra re e muskel. Coldness has touched the wings of birds. Season of ice. This is my tale.
as we celebrate Halloween and All Souls and All Saints Days, we contemplate the passing of loved ones from this life to the next. In Ireland, a key feature of the traditional mourning ritual was the lament. What is a lament? The Latin word lamentum denotes a wailing, mourning cry. In Irish, the word for a lament is crinu, and it is derived from the old Irish verb crinuth, cries, weeps, wails. And those who perform laments are the lucht in crintu, the keeners. It is also indicated by the old Irish phrase octorsha, sorrowing. A crina, a keen, is a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. It was often composed extemporarily and tailored in its performance with a wailing chorus that mourners could join in. So who laments and why? Well, lamenting as a ritual of grieving for persons and places is an ancient practice across many world civilizations. A genre of city laments is known from ancient Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago, where goddesses lament the loss and destruction of their cities, Ur, Uruk, Sumer, Eridu and Nippur. Homer's Iliad, the 8th century BC epic poetic narrative of the final year of the Trojan War features laments, wherein Hector dies and is ritually lamented by his wife Andromache, by his mother Hecabe, and by Helen of Troy, <coughs> each leading companies of women in the mourning rituals for their fallen hero. In the Bible, the Book of Lamentations, a collection of lament poems, mourns the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Similarly, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, contains Kinnoth, laments performed by professional mourning women. In ancient Egypt, the soul of the god Osiris was called back into life by the lamentation and treaty of his sisters Isis and Nephthys. As we see across many traditions, the performance of lamentation is largely led by female figures. Professional keeners, local women, noble women, female family members of the deceased, female literary characters, tutelary goddesses, female spirits and priestesses. It was primarily but not exclusively done by women. In Ireland, Laments are found in rich elegiac bardic poetry, in our great canon of mythic saga, in folklore, in the agency of supernatural persons and portents of death, and in the funerary rites of folk practices of the relatively recent past. Lamenting or keening was a highly respected practice performed at wakes and burials. The crine, Unlike other forms of eulogy, was done in the presence of the deceased person, with the keeners surrounding the corpse, chanting rhythmic verses and wailing over the body during the wake. They keened also accompanying a corpse to its burial. It is no longer in active practice, although elements of wake tradition survive. Wakes involve the provision of food and drink to mourners, Occasional games or entertainments and the keening of the lament over the deceased person. The keeners or criers could be family members or professional female keeners who would be sought to perform the lament on behalf of the family. The skill of these crying women, Manoa Quinte, in the performance of ritual mourning by composing, personalizing, and customizing extemporary laments for the deceased drawing from a repertoire of stock phrases, epithets, and mourning expressions, employing an ancient metrical form for versification, was highly esteemed and a necessary social and ritual societal function. Lady Jane Wilde, Oscar Wilde's mother, Speranza, was an avid collector of folklore. In her book, Legends, Charms, and Superstitions of Ireland, she reports an account of the following. I abridge it. At the wake, the corpse is often dressed in the habit of a religious order. 
A cross is placed in the hands and the scapular on the breast. Candles are lighted all round in a circle and the friends and relatives arrange themselves in due order, the nearest of kin being at the head. At intervals, they all stand up and intone the death wail, rocking backwards and forward over the dead and reciting his virtues, while the widow and orphans frequently salute the corpse with endearing epithets and recall the happy days they spent together. In his book, Irish Wake Amusements, published in 1967, Professor Sean O'Sullivan described a wake with Keening as follows. One stood near the head of the bed or table on which the corpse was laid, one at the feet who was charged with the care of the candles, and one or more at each side. The family and immediate friends of the deceased sat around near the table. The mourner at the head opened the dirge with the first note or part of the cry. She was followed by the one at the foot with a note or part of equal length. Then the long or double part was sung by the two side mourners, after which the members of, family, of the family and friends of the deceased joined in the common chorus at the end of each stanza of the funeral ode or dirge, following as closely as they could the air or tune adapted by the professional mourners. The Kreene, the Keen, therefore had a formulaic structure, beginning with a salutation to the deceased, stating or questioning the reason they have died, sometimes even admonishing them from departing. It is followed by versification of the funeral ode or dirge as described by O'Sullivan, traditionally in an alliterative rusk form of poetry, celebrating the qualities of the deceased, praising the virtues of their family, and concluding each verse with a wailing ululation cried by all mourners, often utilizing specific words or phrases such as oh ho ho nagaso ho no, expressing grief in shared grief in a plaintive cry. Professor Patricia Lysett, in the Encyclopedia of Death and Dying, 2001, informs us that, quote, lamenting was perceived as a strict obligation as well as a custom, end quote. She describes how lamentation occurred in stages during a wake, after the body was laid out, at points when relatives arrived at the wake house, and when the body was placed in the coffin, and that it also occurred en route to the cemetery and by the graveside during burial, but not after it. She states that the lament was, quote, an integral part of the separation rites aimed at gradually removing the deceased from the world of the living, end quote. And she provides an interesting note and evocative imagery of Keening, quote, the ritual character of the lamenting was further enhanced by the rhythmical movement of the women and the use of a variety of mourning gestures and actions." End quote. We see then that the lament or krina had a social function. As a communal expression of grief, it honored the deceased and supported the bereaved family. And it had a spiritual function in its recognition of the transition of the soul from one state of existence to another. It was a funerary practice conducted in a liminal setting on the cusp between two states of existence, life and death.
In Ireland, we have many death customs and folklore of supernatural warnings of impending death. The sound of three knocks on a wall or door, but no one being there to make them was seen as a portent of doom. Similarly, a picture falling off a wall or a bird flying into the house were ill-fated omens. Terrifying otherworldly beings were also believed to foretell death. The Dunahan or Dovlachan, a dark, sullen figure, sometimes reported as headless and riding a horse, was a harbinger of death. The coach the bower, the silent coach or death coach, a spectral coach drawn by four black horses, sometimes driven by the headless Dalahan, was believed to stop at the house of the person who would die that night. But perhaps the most renowned character associated with death in Irish folklore is the Banshee. Belief in her, for she is a female spirit, persists in some quarters today. Her name means fairy woman, but more strictly woman of the fairy mound or woman of the hill, due to the medieval mythology of otherworldly people living in various hills and tumuli of Ireland called Sheevan in Old Irish. Her function is that of a harbinger of death. She does not cause it, but foretells it. To hear the banshee is to be forewarned of an impending death in the locale or in the family with whom she may be associated. Folklore often cites a relationship between certain families whom the banshee is said to follow or cry, and this is deemed to be a positive happenstance with her appearing at the point of death to grieve for the passing soul. Her cry is legendary. Described in myriad folklore records as a long, howling, sobbing, otherworldly, shrieking, mournful cry of grief. Her cry might be heard in the distance, approaching nearer and nearer until it is heard inside the house of the about-to-be-deceased, or it may be witnessed as a passerby encountering blood-freezing howls in the night on a country road, subsequently to find out that someone in the area has passed on. For those who claim to have seen her, she is variously described as a young or an old woman, perhaps more commonly the latter, often cloaked, often with long white hair which she grooms with a comb. She is sometimes described as sitting outside the house of the person nearing death, or gliding in her movements as though her feet are not on the same surface or dimension as we are. Her time of visitation is commonly in the night or at the liminal times of dusk or dawn, as liminal settings are usually associated with supernatural events. Another mythic harbinger of death is the Ban Ni, a mythic person also called the washerwoman at the ford, said to wash the bloodied clothes of army warriors as a premonition of their death in an oncoming battle. In Irish mythology, there are other female spirit characters who also shriek and cry for the death of individuals, but rather than lament, it's more a battle cry of incitement to war. These are the triple aspect war goddesses, the battle crows of the mythic race, the Tuatha de Danann, Bavith or Baith or Baal, Macha, sometimes replaced by Nevan, and the Morrigan, the great queen. These are said to shapeshift from personifications of the war goddesses into that of carrion crows, fluttering and shrieking over the heads of warriors in battle, inciting them to war and to death. By far, the lore of the Banshee still permeates the Irish consciousness, even to recent and present times. A family friend once related to me an experience that he had as a young man. He has passed on himself a few years now, but his account of witnessing the Banshee happened when he was in his late twenties. It was during the 1960s show band era, and Jack, being a gentleman, was walking home a young lady he'd met in a dance hall in Dublin. He saw her safely to her home, and then walked back towards Donnybrook where he lived. He was teetotal all his life, and so sober and alert. It was about one or two in the morning, and he was coming along by Balls Bridge. 
when he heard the most blood-curdling, shrieking cries from behind trees on the other side of the bridge over the river. Three screaming, crying howls in succession, a female voice, but not quite right in sound and tone. Jack looked at me very earnestly as he told me, it was then I saw her. A small woman in long skirts and a hooded cape drifted, that was the word he used, drifted across the road and crossed in front of him. She turned to face him and he said her eyes were sunken with large deep bags underneath and red from crying. He was rooted to the spot in fear. He said he knew she wasn't human, she was something other. She passed him by, and he said it was though she was walking on a different level to the road surface, and then she was gone. He couldn't move for a moment until fear released him, and then he ran home the rest of the way. The day he visited us, his older sister was in accompaniment. She scoffed and said, load of rubbish, but he was serious. He leaned across the armchair towards me and said, it happened, as true as I'm sitting here talking to you. I asked him if someone in the area had passed away at that time, but he didn't know. But he was adamant of what he had seen, and it was real and unsettling. <coughs> so who knows? Here are some sample texts from the National Folklore Archives to illustrate witness accounts of the Banshee. These uh, images are courtesy of the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin and dukas.ie. The first one is a personal account from Leitrim. The old people around this district firmly believed in the Banshee. I often heard my mother say there were certain families that were always cried. These families were the McGowans, the Gallaghers, the Keenies, the Means and the O'Briens. I heard my father say that he and an uncle of his heard the Banshee crying one night just before an old Keeney woman died. A McGowan lad lived beside us. He had a sister married down near Derry Gonley, County Fermanagh. Before the sister died, the story goes, they heard the banshee. I also heard other people saying that they heard the banshee and it always foretold the death of some person. I had a strange personal experience in this connection. On the night of the 14th of March, 1919, the time of the big flu epidemic, my sister and I went out at 10 o'clock to get some turf to rake the fire. Suddenly we heard the most unearthly cry it started about a mile away from us and ran along the ground for about half a mile. Then it began to ascend and went up, 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 getting fainter as it went until it died away in the sky. We never heard anything so weird and concluded that it must be the Banshee. We went home and told our people that we heard a Banshee. They laughed at us. But it happened that our next door neighbour, Mrs D, whose maiden name was Gallagher, took the flu that night and was dead that day week. The next account is for also from Leitrim, from Newtown War. I never heard the Banshee until about 12 months ago when a neighbour woman named Mrs Brennan died last year at the age of 87. The night before she died, the Banshee was down in the bog under her house crying for her. It was a long, lonesome cry. It seemed to me that it was coming closer to me and getting plainer. I listened to it for a good while, and I did not know what it was. I called my mother out of the house to listen to what was crying, and she told me that it was the banshee who always cries when he's going to a death in this family. <coughs> the next one is from Carra Robert, County Mayo. She is to be seen when two people in one village are dead. She usually has a light in her hand and is seen coming along the road from the dead person's house and always crying. She is dressed in white 
and comes to the house where the person is dead. She makes a great noise and sometimes knocks at the door, making a great rattle. When she is heard, the people put their backs to the doors till the noise has gone away. When a person is dead, if there is a light seen, the people say that the person is going to heaven. If there is a banshee seen, it is said that the person is going to purgatory. But if the light is seen, people say the person is going to heaven. They say that a light is best to see when a person is dying. In our mythos, nature itself is capable of lament, conveying warnings of death through natural or supernatural events. In the myth tale, Imagalav and Thor Furad, the colloquy of the two sages, the sea is the agent of lament, conveying the sad news of the death of the chief poet or olive of Ireland, Agna Mac Uthidur, to his son Nede, who, standing on the seashore in Scotland, hears a strange noise in the sea and casts a spell of divination upon the wave to find what news it brings. The tale is found in several manuscripts, including the 12th century Book of Leinster, the version you see here, manuscript 1339, courtesy of Irish script on screen in Trinity College, Dublin. The language itself is a bit older, that of the 10th century AD. It's written in the Middle Irish language. I read a little from this text. Agna Makuthir, the Huith of Ulnaid Mach, Olaf Aaron, in Aigshe, Agus Philide. Agna Makuthir of the people of the Ulnaid Mach, the tribes of Connacht, was the chief poet of Ireland in seership and poetic skill. At the Covenant Mach Lashida, Ed Ulnaid, he happened to have a son, that is, Naid. Lid irith in Makshin the Uglun Eichse in Alban, Kahoko Ekvel, Agus Ravi Ifarad Echach, Gurbaholach in Eichse. The boy went then to learn seership in Scotland with Achu Ekvel, and he was in the company of Achu until he was learned in poetic skills. Lid la and in Gila Kami for Brumara, Arbavalia Falshifte Eichse the Grace Lasna Filida for Bru Ishke. One day, the boy went to the edge of the sea, for the edge of water was always a place of revelation among the poets. Cochula in Gila Fogger is in Pind, Edon Chorus Crina de August Tersche, August Bahingen Adlesh. The boy heard a murmur in the wave, that is, a chorus of wailing and sorrowing, and it was strange to him. Rola ira vin gila bricht for simpind kura alshiv hiv do kid rami. The boy then cast a spell upon the wave so that it revealed to him what would be for him. Kadarfis do in irsin, kane de kreene de ahar of the intund, agus kadaga de thignek de erkat in a fille, agus rogav olivnus in una de ahersav. Edon Adne. It was shown to him after that that the wave was lamenting his father and that his mantle had been given to the poet Ferkertene and that he had taken the olive ship in place of his father, that is, Adne. Lid ira vin gila dia feig agus ad feid dia ade edon de ochig et as bertse de fris aerg dag theori vexa Ni thala adar neigse ar ni sin o'n vare, o'r forasnid eigsedich i the olive ar olis. The boy then went to his dwelling and told this to his foster father, that is, Achu. And he, Achu, said to him, 
Go now to your country. There is no room for both of our skills in one place. When your seership enlightens you, you are a master of knowledge. A famous piece of music, Port Nabuki, the Lament of the Fairies, has an otherworldly origin story, or rather several of them. The one I heard being that at night on Inish Vikolon, one of the Blasket Islands off the south coast of Ireland, an elderly couple living there heard a strange sound coming in over the sea, getting closer and closer on the wind. It was the lamenting song of a woman taken by the fairies, unable to return home to her former life. She laments her circumstance in a beautiful, strange, melancholic melody that is said to echo the sound of humpback whales that visit the waters around Ireland. The elderly woman's husband, who played the fiddle, was able to get the air down and play it, giving rise to Port Nabuki, the fairy's lament, or Queen Inahinsha, the lament of the island. Robin Flower, the scholar of Anglo-Saxon, Celticist poet and former deputy keeper of manuscripts in the British Museum, first visited the Blasket Islands in 1910 and learned Irish there under the tuition of his mentor, Tomás O'Crean. In his book, The Western Isle, first published in 1944, he tells an origin story of the lament of the fairies. I quote, In the old days, when the island was inhabited, a man sat alone one night in his house, soothing his loneliness with a fiddle. He was playing, no doubt, the favourite music of the countryside, jigs and reels and hornpipes, the hurrying tunes that would put light heels on the feet of the dead. But as he played, he heard another music without. Going over the roof in the air, it passed away to the cliffs and returned again, and so backwards and forwards again and again, a wandering air wailing in repeated phrases, till at last it had become familiar in his mind, and he took up the fallen bow and drawing it across the strings, followed note by note the lamenting voices as they passed above him. Ever since, that tune, Port Nabuki, the fairy music, has remained with his family, skilled musicians all, and if you hear it played by a fiddler of that race, you will know the secret of Inish Vikalon. Another story tells of how a man of the O'Dolly family, who once owned Inishwick alone, was fishing in the waters around the Blasket Islands, and he heard the lament coming to him from the sea. He memorised it and figured out how to play it on his fiddle when he got home. He called it Port Nabuki, the fairy's lament.
both oral and literary traditions in Ireland are rich with poetry, eulogy and elegy from 8th or 9th century early poetry through the great tradition of elegant and complex bardic poetry of the later classical Irish period. Perhaps the most famous lament known today is from later again, the 18th century, the Quina Arth O'Leary, the lament for Art O'Leary, composed in 1773 by his wife, Eileen Dovney Connell, aunt of the famous politician, the liberator, Daniel O'Connell. Her husband, Art, was shot by agents of the local landowner over his refusal to sell his horse for the paltry sum of five pounds, as the penal laws at the time made it illegal for an Irish person to own a horse over that value. She composed it over his body and keened him in the tradition of the Quina, there at the roadside where she found him lying and again at his wake. A local Ben Quintre, a keener, nor any Hindula, memorized it and transmitted it, and so we have it today. It is a powerful piece of poetic lament and has been extensively studied and published by scholars, film and TV programs made about it and has inspired poets of later generations. However, it's also very long and an 18th century composition. And so the readings I give you tonight are excerpts for some beautiful poetic pieces from the medieval literature of earlier centuries which contain motifs of lament. The first of these is from a myth tale in the canon of the Finiacht, the tales of Finn Macul. It is from the Agal of Nishanorach, the colloquy of the ancients, a 12th century framework of tales of the exploits of Finn and the Fianna, supposedly related by Crilte, one of the warriors of the Fianna, and Ushin, son of Finn, to St. Patrick. These tales are preserved as copies in several manuscripts of the 15th and 16th centuries. At the Battle of Fiontro, Ventry in County Kerry, the warrior Coyle is drowned. His fairy lover and wife, Crede, upon discovering his body washed up on the shore, laments his death and noted that even the wild creatures were dying in grief with him. And again, the sea is the agent of lament, pounding the strand in sorrow. So we're running a little over time, so I'm just going to read a few verses from it. Basoif lim coil, the vet i richt mar of remthiv, ton de thecht tara hev nial, is ed romer neib a eve. Grievous to me that coil should be as one dead by my side, and that wave should have swept over his fair body. The greatness of his beauty set my wits astray. Throig in gar guni ton troch de betroig, or avoid fair shay de soil, saithlim quail de null na noil. Sad is the cry made by the shore's wave upon the beach, since it drowned a fine noble man. It is grievous to me that coil ever went near it. Throig in form the knee in thun rish in throch thud, a kyangal im charig queen, a queen ith coil of the hood. Sad is the sound made by the wave on the northern shore, rioting around a great rock, lamenting coil since he died. Throig in thras the knee in thun rish in throch thas, misha the jacket moray, messager. Sad is the strife waged by the wave against the southern shore. As for me, my life has reached its term, and by reason of it, my appearance, as clear to all, has suffered. Clink a cord and eat hun rum tullock flesh, mission loch and whale marine, or avoid in scale rum gesh. Strange music is made by the heavy wave of Thalaklesh. As for me, my wealth does not exist since it boasted to me the tale which his roar has borne to me. Or avoided Machrithan, Nachan Wilma Invan da Aish, is more trieth rohit la alov, a shkith illo, goy, nirgesh. Since the son of Krithan has been drowned, 
No one I may love exists after him. Many chieftains fell by his hand. His shield never cried out a day in stress. And I should say, um, this text is from Professor Jared Murphy's wonderful compilation of early Irish lyrics. I would also like to give you an example from a little earlier. That poem is 12th century. This poem, The Lament of the Old Woman of Bera, is dated to about the 8th or 9th century linguistically, according to scholars. The Old Woman of Bera is the mythical Calith Veri, the Veiled One of Bera, or the Witch of Bera. She was a sovereignty goddess of Munster, a spirit of the land, of agriculture, allied to sacral kingship. Her name is Bui, so named, one presumes, for her yellow tressed hair in youth that has now greyed and been shorn and veiled as she enters the convent and the age of Christianity. She laments the passing of the age of kings and bemoans the passing of her youth, wishing she could return to her days of summer. This poem is full of metaphors of loss, decay and overturning of what used to be, as once a glorious age now seeps away as the sea ebbs from the shore. The summer of youth is contrasted with the coldness of winter of age, the loss of status into obscurity and richness into poverty. Her time of feasting with kings is now spent in darkness in an oratory with only whey water to imbibe. Again, the poem is quite long and we're over time, so I will read just a few verses here and only in English, conveying the sadness of the slipping into old age when she was once the toast of kings. Ebb tide has come to me as to the sea. Old age makes me yellow. Though I may grieve thereat, it approaches its food joyfully. When my arms are seen, all bony and thin, the craft they used to practice was pleasant. They used to be about the glorious kings. I speak no honeyed words. No weathers are killed for my wedding. My hair is scant and grey. To have a mean veil over it causes no regret. Summer of youth in which we have been, I spent with its autumn. Winter of age which overwhelms everyone. Its first months have come to me. I am cold indeed. Every acorn is doomed to decay. After feasting by bright candles to be in the darkness of an oratory. The flood wave and that of swift ebb. What the flood wave brings to you, the ebb wave carries out of your hand. It is well for an island of the great sea. Flood comes to it after its ebb. As for me, I expect no flood after ebb to come to me. Today, there is scarcely a dwelling place I could recognize. What was in flood is all ebbing. And so ends the lament of the old woman of Bera, again from Professor Gerard Murphy's early Irish lyrics. We in Ireland are fortunate to have the largest collection of vernacular literature in Europe outside of classical Greek and Rome. We have thousands and thousands of myth tales, histories, genealogies, hagiographies, folklore, Brehem law, medical and legal texts, prayers, spells, hymns, and poetry from the eighth century to the present day. It is our responsibility to preserve it and pass it on. We hope you enjoyed the readings from various eras, and indeed you probably have tales of your own to tell. Do pass them on. It's how they survive, and it's important. In a moment, I will hand back to Father Gary to close the evening, but before I do, some acknowledgements. Firstly, I would like to thank Father Gary himself for the invitation to speak this evening, and I apologize to you all that we're running a bit over time. He's going to formally thank everyone in a few minutes, but he won't thank himself, so I want to take the opportunity to do it, as it was his idea to have an evening themed on lament and Samhain at this time of year. We then worked with Dominique and her wonderful choir, Vocari, 
and with Mick and Mary to incorporate the beautiful music that we heard played and sung tonight. We also had great support from all the team here in Newman and, has, and also the House of Bridget. I would like to thank Father Finbar Tracy and Kairos Communications Limited for providing the scenic film footage you saw this evening. My deep thanks to Professor Damien McManus of Trinity College Dublin for proofreading my transcription and translation of the excerpt about Neda uh, from the 12th century Book of Leinster. Any mangled pronunciations or errors are truly mine alone. Um, we thank Stephen C. Warner for his kind permission to perform his beautiful composition, Beloved Sleep Well, which was influenced by the Irish Keening tradition. I wish to acknowledge Irish script on screen at the School of Celtic Studies at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies for permission to display the page from the Book of Leinster, TCD, Manuscript 1339. ISOS is a wonderful project. It's a repository of scanned images of medieval manuscripts in various collections here and abroad. You can go online to their website as listed on the pamphlet and view them and learn about their contents. I would also like to acknowledge Dukas.ie and the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin for the images of folkloric accounts of the Banshee. You can go to duchus.ie to view folklore records and sort by topic or locale, and you might find some interesting information from your own area. And lastly, the reason we can read these tales and recite the poetry is due to the genius of the poets and storytellers who compose them, and the work of scribes long ago who labored in scriptoria in monasteries legal and poetic schools, and faithfully inscribed Irish and Latin texts to vellum manuscripts. So our thanks must be to them for the gift they gave us that we can enjoy up to 1,500 years later. I think it's fair to acknowledge their great legacy. And now I hand back to Father Gary for his concluding remarks before Mick and Mary play us out. My purpose here is brief, mostly it's to uh, thank Rona Fogarty for all of her work. I'd also like to give my sincerest thanks to all of you for coming for the, to this evening, for entering into this effort and for celebrating the depth and richness of our Irish heritage and traditions. I especially want to thank Rona for her words and her untold hours of research and reflection that she put into tonight's presentation, including editing while you were arriving. It was truly a monumental undertaking and we're most appreciative. Some of her sources are available and listed on the back of the handout and as she just described them, should you wish to explore it further. Again, I want to thank Mick and Mary for their work, for their efforts to bring texture and beauty to this evening, to help transform it from a lecture to an event. Thanks also to Dominique and to the members of the Vocari Ensemble who sang this evening. Their work regularly transforms our prayer here at University Church into the sublime, and we are most appreciative. Song helps make our whole beings into songs of praise. As we ready ourselves to leave this place and gather in the back for a cup of tea and a bit of natter, let us call to mind those who have died in this month of remembrance, our own beloved dead, and especially those who have no one to pray for them. We are one in our humanity, and we are made one in Christ. Next Friday evening at 7 p.m., Bokari will lead us again in prayer in a service for all who have died, our remembrance prayer. You're most welcome to join us again on that occasion. As we go, let us make our prayer the prayer of St. John Henry Newman, a man who traveled through many periods, shrouded in darkness, a saintly builder of this very church, dedicated to searching out truth in every aspect of life and learning, and a true saint for our times, and a shining exemplar of a life lived in hope. Newman has faced much adversity in his life, economic ruin, financial hardship, crippling bouts of anxiety and the sudden and tragic death of his beloved sister. And yet he moved through moments of darkness with grace. And so let us make his words our own. 
May the Lord support us all the day long, till the shades lengthen and the evening comes, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, in his mercy, may he give us a safe lodging, and holy rest, and peace at the last. Amen. Thank you for coming.